So, um, I said my name is Sergi. Uh, so last last week I was uh, at the Spring I/O in Barcelona. Actually, that's my conference, uh, which is the best. Or actually, not the best only, but the only uh, Spring conference in in Europe, right? And the and the biggest one. So, um, so Michael, one of the organizers of the talk, just uh, asked me to deliver a talk here because uh, I was here anyway for the box day. So I didn't have anything uh, ready for, to prepare, but uh, at least we're going to do a quick introduction to um, the new uh, generation of uh, Spring applications. So how many of you use Spring Boot here? Spring Boot 2? Some of you? Spring 5? None of you. Hmm, weird. All right, so there have been a lot of efforts in the new releases of Spring, not only Spring 5, but also Spring Boot 2, which came out uh, a couple of months ago. And um, most of the efforts have going uh, towards the reactive support, right? uh, in the core also, but in Spring Boot, but also in the entire portfolio. So that applies to Spring Security, Spring Data, Spring Cloud, Spring Integration, and many other uh, projects in the portfolio, right? Because uh, we're basically changing the uh, programming model, right? So from an, in, uh, an, uh, an imperative programming uh, style into a more declarative programming style, right? So we're going to see um, in the next slides, right? So what Spring 5 and Spring Boot 2 uh, basically give us, right? As uh, this new generation of uh, applications. So I'm going to lead you through a quick introduction on the new features, and then I'm going to I try to start with the current model of uh, programming, like traditional Spring MVC, and we're going to move it to a WebFlux uh, model, which is uh, what Spring 5 uh, is uh, introducing, right? It's, that's yeah, going to be in a demo. So we're going to uh, basically move from the blocking uh, kind of uh, operations and uh, basically models, right? Because um, uh, we have been using this model for a long time, right? So usually we had web applications with uh, traditional servlet containers using the servlet APIs, right? I interacting with uh, data stores which were blocking, right? At the end of the day, uh, every single request got a new thread of execution. So we're basically having a, a bunch of threads, right? A thread pool that uh, we shared, right? But this is not scaling anymore, right? So if we take a look at other uh, languages like Node.js, Node.js had the uh, concept of the event loop. And uh, we basically had non-blocking operations and basically reusing the same threads for the different tasks that we had. So it was more an event-driven model, right? So it's not like a blocking model, but we're going to move into a non-blocking model. And this has a lot of uh, benefits, right? So we need just a small thread pool, so we don't need a uh, a different thread for every single, single request. We can live with a small number of threads, and uh, basically we'll be processing events on those threads. Right? So we're not going to block on those uh, threads. So the important thing here is to be uh, non-blocking from end to end. So if you have a database which is blocking, right, if you're using JPA, if you're using a relational database and there's no um, asynchronous driver, well, you're going to block anyway, right? So actually, we should be blocking from uh, all the way down. So we take a look at the current model, right? So the current model where we have the servlet API is basically based on a servlet container. So we use Tomcat, we use Jetty, we use Undertow, we use any servlet container. On top of that, we use the servlet API. Right? So all, we, we all know the servlet API, and we basically use frameworks that um, rely on the servlet API. And if, you, if you're using a Spring, you probably use a Spring MVC. Maybe you're using uh, Jersey or any other uh, framework. But at the end of the day, this is a blocking model. So we're going to move into a non-blocking or reactive uh, model. So now we're not going to rely on the servlet API because it's actually um, of blocking, but we're going to use a uh, container like Netty or any of the servlet 3.1 containers which support async operations already. So on top of that, as I said, uh, we're not going to use the servlet API because it's blocking, but we're going to have some adapters which will use the reactive stream specification. So we're going to see that uh, the project reactor, which is part of the portfolio of Spring, is an implementation of the reactive stream uh, specification. So Spring 5 introduces a new uh, web framework, which is called WebFlux. 
So it's important to understand that this is not replacing what we had, it's the Spring MVC framework. So both models are valid options. It just depends on the use case, but we have uh, both frameworks side by side. So we not have to question whether we should use a Spring MVC or a Spring with Flux. Well, both are options, and depending on what you need, you might be using one or another one. So if you're using a relational database which is blocking, and you have blocking operations on the way down, so maybe you'll be using a Spring MVC. If you have just non-blocking uh, operations all the way down, and you are using like MongoDB or Redis or Cassandra, and you have uh, a non-blocking reactive driver, then you might be using a WebFlux um, uh, framework, right? So we have actually these two uh, different stacks that make sense, right? Depending on the use case that you have. So Reactive Spring came out not to be fast or faster, but to uh, to scale better, right? So if you take your traditional Spring MVC uh, application and try to migrate it to WebFlux, you'll see that you won't get any more performance or actually any more speed. So the speed will be the same, right? So the reactive support, the reactive uh, web framework is not uh, meant to be faster than a Spring MVC, but more scalable than a Spring MVC, right? So when you have like uh, slow um, consumers or devices like a, a mobile uh, phone or application that might have a slow connection, or you have like uh, slow uh, producers as well, so that's basically where you're gonna get uh, uh, more performance, right? So basically it's meant for scalability and not a speed. So everything will be non-blocking, as we have seen, and we're going to focus on events. So we're going to have events that we'll be uh, subscribing on, and we're going to react on those uh, events. So set Spring MVC is also an option. It's not that we have to use the web flags, the new framework that comes in uh, Spring 5. So we have actually these two stacks. So Spring 5 um, is using the project reactor underneath. That's one of the building blocks of a Spring 5, and now a Spring Boot as well, and every single project that uses uh, all the reactive support. So the project reactor is basically an implementation of the reactive streams specification. And we have actually different implementations. It just happens that uh, well, uh, we have right one in the, in the portfolio. I said this is not uh, part of a Spring. It's its own project, right? but the Spring is using it underneath. So the two main types that uh, the project reactor has are basically the mono and the flux. The mono specifies one single value, right? So that's saying, well, we have something, something, right? And this something is uh, defined as a, t as a type, parameterized. And the flux are basically uh, zero or more values. So this is basically a stream or values, which is unb unbounded in time. So we don't know when they are going to come, but we're going to have a stream of values and we can react on those values. So all these types right, are going to be used uh, everywhere in the portfolio. We, gonna, we can use them in the web layer, in the data access layer, right, and uh, in many other uh, projects like a Spring Cloud and so on in, uh, in a Spring, um, the Spring portfolio. So we take a look at the WebFlux framework, which is, as I said, the new framework um, that the Spring 5 um, introduces. Uh, it comes with in, in two flavors. So the first one is the annotation-based uh, flavor, and the other one is the functional flavor. So how many of you use the Spring MVC again? Some of you? All right. So we are used to, to the traditional controllers, like the add controllers, rest controllers with the request mappings and so on. You don't have to um, uh, relearn right, the, the a web, a web framework. You can reuse the concepts that you, that you uh, basically know and use the reactive types on those controllers. So we are basically adapting the same programming model that we know because, well, even if this is a new uh, um, programming style, we don't have to give away all, all our knowledge. So if you take a look at what happens underneath, the runtime is completely different. Right? So we see that, well, um, or we go asynchronous, non-blocking, compared to the blocking synchronous servlet API, but the programming style will be kind of the same. So if you want to get started with uh, the WebFlux uh, framework, maybe the annotation-based uh, configuration might be the easiest way to do it. But if you are more a functional guy, 
we have also the functional support. So in here, we see uh, an alternative to the controllers, which is basically uh, a way to have control over how to map the request into a handler. So what we can do is to basically create the router functions and define that we have maybe get request, and we pass this request to a handler. So we can inline the uh, processing of this request, so you can define a Lambda expression in there, or you can use method references that will go to uh, a method to process uh, those requests. So that's basically the, uh, well, that's basically what we have seen. That's basically the Webflux uh, framework, right? So either the annotation based or the more functional way to uh, configure the web layer. And uh, well, if you take a look at the handlers, those handlers will return a mono, right? So we can return a mono, we can return uh, well, uh, uh, flux as well. So we'll be using flux and mono right, everywhere where we deal with reactive types. So we're gonna see that in the demo. So Spring 5 also uh, provides reactive WebSockets. Right? So WebSockets have been supported in Spring for a long time, since Spring 4. And actually, we had a support for raw WebSockets and also for uh, sub-protocols like Stomp right, in, uh, uh, over WebSockets. So Spring 5 introduces the reactive support for WebSockets. Uh, we don't have a sub-protocol right, uh, um, available for reactive WebSockets, but at least we can deal with the messages coming in, coming out uh, reactively by right, using uh, Monus and Fluxes uh, as well. So how many of you use uh, WebSockets here? Have tried WebSockets at some point? Some of you? All right. Another uh, place where we have uh, reactive support is Spring Data. Spring Data is the umbrella project to all the uh, data access technologies. Right? So it could be JPA, but also Redis, Cassandra, or Elasticsearch, Solar. Right? So there are some community-driven projects and some other projects are maintained by, by Pivotal. So the new uh, Spring Data K um, uh, release is basically having the uh, reactive support. So that means that we'll have reactive templates. So the templates are these APIs like the uh, Mongo template and Redis template that, allow, that have these one-liner methods uh, to basically interact with the um, uh, database. And then we have also uh, a way to create uh, reactive repositories. So basically, you can create the interfaces and get these instant repositories for uh, um, reactive non-blocking uh, repositories. So in terms of uh, the reactive modules, so currently we have MongoDB, Cassandra, Redis, and Couchbase. So of course, uh, JPA is blocking, so there's no way to have a reactive repository for JPA. Right? So there are some works uh, towards the JDBC asynchronous drivers, but there's, uh, I mean, that's, uh, the work is ongoing, so there's no support for creating uh, instant repositories for um, relational databases currently. But at least we'll have support for multiple NoSQL uh, data stores. Spring Security is uh, also another project that uh, has embraced uh, Reactive, because if we take a look at how Spring Security worked previously, uh, for a web request, uh, we usually had a sublet, in a sublet filter. So the sublet filter intercepted the, the request. It applied the um, authorization and authentication before delegating to our controllers. So now we don't have or we don't use the sublet API anymore. So that model is gone. We cannot use it right? because we don't rely on the sublet API. So having or placing a sublet filter in, in before the, uh, the controllers is not an option anymore. So it has. Uh, so Spring Security has done a lot of work to be able to integrate with the Web, WebFlux framework, but also for the reactive um, uh, method security, because previously the security context was stored in the, as a third local uh, variable. Right. So uh, and we know that in a reactive environment, we'll be reusing those threads. We won't have a thread per request. So that's gone. That model is, is gone. So that means that what we had before, which was storing the security context in the threat um, in in the threat local, is not a valid option anymore. Right? So uh, Spring Security is now using the context from um, the project reactor that actually works with a reactive environment. So Spring Security 5 can protect uh, any uh, request 
that is handled by Webflux. Any request uh, which is reactive that goes into any method in your application and also has some nice uh, testing uh, support. But if we take a look at the way to configure Spring Security in a reactive environment, that hasn't changed much from the configuration we had. It just happens that, well, again, we reuse the knowledge we have, but how everything works underneath completely changes. Right? So this is kind of transparent to us. So internally, we won't use any servlet filter. We won't use any thread local. So everything has changed uh, quite a lot. In terms of messaging, and especially when you build um, uh, microservices, there's a project called the Spring Cloud Stream. So Spring Cloud Stream will help you uh, deal with uh, uh, microservice communication by using any messaging broker. This could be Kafka, this could be RabbitMQ, but the main goal is that we have different microservices and we kind of abstract the messaging layer and we send messages and, and consume messages from those uh, microservices in, well, basically, uh, abstracting from the broker we have uh, in between. So um, a Spring Cloud Stream uh, basically uses Spring integration underneath to uh, provide this connectivity to all the different brokers. The set could be RabbitMQ or Kafka. And it also has our integration with the reactive support. So anyone used Spring Cloud Stream before? No? All right. So I'm not going to go in depth with that, but basically what we'll have is uh, a channel. That's where we uh, can get messages from. And this can be defined as a flux. Right? So this is uh, an unbound um, message stream. So basically, we'll basically consume messages as they come. And we can also send publish messages to uh, another channel that will be consumed maybe by uh, another microservice. So Spring Boot Actuator has also had um, quite a lot of uh, work in the Spring Boot 2. Anyone familiar with the Actuator? Some of you? So the Actuator um, exposes different endpoints. So you can uh, know about the health of your application, or you know about the environment variables of your application, or, I don't know, the bins that are in the application context, and many other things. Right? So now the Actuator works for Spring MVC, for Webflux, or even with Jersey. Right? So uh, regardless of the web framework you use, the Actuator will give you all this information and metrics as well that um, uh, that will give you a lot of uh, information at, ru at runtime. If you want to extend Spring Boot Actuator, you can also do it uh, easily, right? So in Spring Boot 2, um, there have been some annotations introduced so you can extend the Actuator endpoints and expose your own uh, endpoints. One of the uh, main uh, changes in Spring Boot 2 and, and in the Actuator is that uh, Micrometer has been introduced. So Micrometer is basically uh, like SL SL4J but for metrics. In SL4J, well, we have different logging frameworks, right? but we want a facade on top of those frameworks that abstracts us from what we have underneath. So Micrometer is uh, basically the same thing but for metrics. So we don't care whether we use Prometheus or Netflix Atlas or Influx or uh, Datadog. So we, had, we want to have a consistent way or an, an abstraction on top of that so we can use the same API, but just by changing the implementation, we can actually use Prometheus or Atlas or Influx, right, which is really nice. Right? So previously in a Spring Boot 1, if you, if you use the actuator um, metrics, we had kind of unidine, unidimensional um, metrics. So that means that, well, you could have the number of requests, for instance, but then if you uh, wanted to drill down a little, a little bit and you wanted to get only the get request but not the post request, you had to create yet another metric. Right? So maybe HTTP request dot get or dot post. If you want to get the 404 uh, errors in a get request, you, have, you had to create yet another metric, which was HTTP dot request dot get dot 404. Right? So it was kind of unidimensional. So Micrometer is basically giving you a multidimensional perspective on the metrics. So we're going to add tax to the metrics so you can uh, analyze these metrics by different tax. We're going to see that an, an example in a second. Another thing that has been uh, introduced, which uh, is getting a lot of traction, is the Kotlin uh, support. How many of you, of you use Kotlin? Heard about it. All right. 
So Kotlin has a lot of traction in the Android community, right? So Kotlin is uh, an official language in Android, right? So maybe in Gradle as well, a little bit of uh, traction. And Spring 5 uh, uh, is also, right, uh, embracing uh, Kotlin. So now when you go to the initializer, you can select Kotlin as a language. We have Java, we have Kotlin, we have Groovy, right? And uh, it's basically a JVM language, but it's uh, more concise, statically, statically typed, and uh, you have like more elegant code, right? More concise. So um, I recommend you to uh, check out uh, Kotlin and the integration. So for now, we have a Spring uh, framework which uh, uh, supports uh, Kotlin, Spring Boot as well, Spring Data, and the uh, Reactor uh, project. So set when you go to the initializer, which is basically how we uh, start a Spring. Uh, project, you can select Kotlin right, as, a, as a language. So this will create already a, a Gradle or a Maven project right, uh, with uh, Kotlin. If we take a look at uh, some examples of uh, like basic things in Kotlin. So if you um, if we take a look at uh, like at the main class, right, like a speaker. So we see that well, we don't have to use or define the getters, setters, right? And uh, this is actually more concise. So we define this is like an immutable class. So we define the different properties of the class, like as ID, the name, the last name. And notice how the last name can be optional. So this is basically defining a constructor with uh, three parameters and in order to avoid having more than one constructor, we are going to uh, define one of these parameters as being optional. So this is a more concise way to define uh, our classes. So we take a look at the uh, REST controller. Right, so the REST controller, uh, this is just a Spring MVC uh, controller, uh, basically defines a, uh, the speaker repository as a dependency. And notice how we have a, these concise methods or these concise mappings, like the get mapping, where uh, we define a, a function, which is the find all. And uh, the type of the return of this function is basically uh, taken from what the repository find all will return. So we don't have to explicitly define the, um, the type. So that's going to be inferred. And the same applies to the second mapping. So this is concise. We use the path variable notation, and we basically uh, delegate to the repository uh, find by name. HTTP2. So the, um, using or enabling HTTP2 in a Spring Boot 2 is uh, quite easy, right? So you just need to enable the property server.http2 enabled in the application properties, but uh, that requires uh, something else depending on the server container that, that we use. So for instance, in, on Tomcat, if you use Tomcat 9 with the JDK 9, everything works fine, right? Because uh, the JDK 9 is what uh, has uh, HTTP 2 support. But if you're using HTTP, uh, the JDK 8, uh, then you'll have to use a, uh, a library, right? So you, you can pass the, where the library is as a JVM uh, argument. The same applies to, to Jetty, right? so it requi requires uh, another library, which you have to pass. And uh, in terms of uh, Undertow, everything will work right, with the JDK 8, so there's nothing to be uh, configured. But if you need to use Tomcat, then you'll either you have to use Tomcat 9 with JDK 9 or pass the library. But it's quite straightforward to enable the HTTP2 uh, support. All right, any questions so far? No? So how much time do we have? Ten minutes. Huh? Ten minutes only. Okay. So I wanted to do the, um, the demo from scratch, but I think that uh, we won't have time to do it in, in ten minutes. Uh, I have the same problem as before, that, my, that this freezes my IntelliJ. I don't know why. It's actually the adapter which is freezing my IntelliJ. <laughs> VI, that would be an option, yes. <laughs> it's kind of weird because I plug the adapter and then all of a sudden my IntelliJ freezes, but not my computer. Right, so it's just IntelliJ freezing. So we turn it off. Try turn it off now. Does it? Does it? Yeah, you can. Does it? Okay. 
Now it's working. Okay. Um, uh, okay, we'll try this one. And we need to project the. Now my IntelliJ crashed. Maybe I'll have to focus a little bit. Hey, what's going there? Almost there. there. Almost there. So as we have like five minutes left only, um, I'm just going to show it real quick. Um, so I'll try to uh, build a reactive web application from end-to-end. -end. So I have here my uh, domain class, which is a speaker. And uh, if you're familiar with uh, Spring Data, Spring Data uh, is the umbrella project for a lot of uh, different uh, repo repository technologies. I'm going to use uh, MongoDB in this case. So in JPA, we have the standard annotations to uh, map our domain objects into the relational database. And in Spring Data, as other uh, data uh, stores don't have these, uh, these annotations, provides annotations so you can map those, um, those domain objects into the data source. Uh, so we, ha we are using uh, MongoDB, we'll be using the add document annotation, and we're going to give uh, an ID to this document, which is going to be this string. All right, so now we'll create a repository. So this repository uh, is a reactive repository. So we have uh, reactive support for MongoDB. So if you're using Spring Data, you can use the reactive repositories. So we'll be extending from the reactive Mongo repository. So we take a look at uh, the definition of the reactive um, repository. This is extending from the reactive sorting repository, and this is at the same time uh, extending from the reactive CRUD repository and from the reactive CRUD yeah, from, from the repository itself. So we're going to inherit all the CRUD operations and sorting operations and all the Mongo operations uh, for free. So these, these are called the instant repositories. So we don't need to implement anything. So we basically defined an interface that extends one of the Spring Data MongoDB um, uh, interfaces. And uh, this will inherit all, the, uh, all these methods. And at runtime, there will be a proxy created that will have all the implemented methods. So you can just take this uh, interface, inject it anywhere, and use any of the uh, methods that have been created. But you can also define your own methods. And that's basically what we see here, is that uh, we create a find by name method. So we're basically getting a name, and we're going to return a mono. So when you call this method, it will come back to you right away. So this is uh, non-blocking, right? So we call it, and it comes back to you right away. So eventually, this uh, single value, because mon mono is a single value, will be available uh, to you. If we take a look at the other methods uh, in the um, interface, we see that some of them return mono, some of them return flux, depending on the operation. But basically, we're going to get single values or um, like multiple values, depending on what we are doing. All right. So if we take a look at the um, 
controllers, the reactive controllers. So this is just a normal Spring MVC controller, or it looks like a Spring MVC controller, but we are using the reactive types instead of returns like uh, objects or strings and so on. So we see, or we have seen, that now our, our repository returns monos and flux. So we, think we can take those monos and flux and, and send them directly upwards. Oops, I just messed around with that. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. So we can just uh, take those monos and fluxes and send them directly to the MVC layer. So now we see how we return flux, right? When we want to get the speakers, for instance, we call the find all from the repository, we return a flux, and we return a mono when uh, we find by find a speaker by name. So one of the main things about the uh, project reactor, if you're used, if you have used uh, Arc Java or Arc JS, you'll you'll be familiar with that. But one of the uh, main things of Project Reactor is the composition of the different uh, methods. So all the mono and fluxes can be composed, right? And we can apply operations on those monos and fluxes. So then I have a uh, an entry point. So that's basically the Spring Boot application. And what I have here is a, an application runner that will run just the before the hour uh, when the application starts. So I'm basically creating a couple of speakers. So I'm creating a flux with uh, specific names right, of speakers, Sergi and Michael. I'm going to map those into uh, a speaker class. So I'm going to create a new speaker out of these names, and then I'm going to call the, uh, or I'm going to pass them to the repository to store them. So notice that this is just a flux definition. So we are moving from the uh, imperative programming style, from when this happens, then do this, to a more declarative style. So I'm taking these names and just mapping them to uh, speakers, and then please. Um, uh, store them. So this flux definition is not doing anything until we subscribe to it. Right? So this is basically the definition. This is our publisher. This is basically what will create speakers. But when we write this, nothing will happen until we subscribe. So the subscription is down here, but before doing the subscription, we want to make sure that no speaker is, in the, uh, is on MongoDB. So the first thing that we'll do is delete everything on the database. And this is also a non-blocking operation. So that means that if we just uh, do delete all and then right away insert, well, the delete all comes back to you right away. So we have to wait somehow. And blocking doesn't seem to be the right option. So what we're going to do is to compose this call. So we're going to delete all and then Let's do something else. So this is basically saying, well, just complete this operation. And then let's do something else. And I'm going to pass what I just created here, which is this flux, this producer. So I'm going to get those names, map them to speakers, and basically store them into the database. All right. And then we have here the um, alternative way to declare our endpoints. So this is the functional web framework. Right, so now, instead of using a controller, what we are going to do is to define a the router, fu router functions, where we define a route for the speaker name, and then we define here a land expression. So this is basically what will process the request. So when we get this, then we're going to get a path variable, and we're going to create an OK response. So that means a 200 status code response with the body being what's returned by the find name method, method on the repository. So we st um, if we start this, just real quick. I have the port, a the port open somewhere. So if I have it somewhere, that means that this is running somewhere. All right, so when I go to uh, localhost 8080 slash speakers, I'm going to see both of them. Uh, speakers, I think it's a uh, speaker's name or a speaker. Can't remember. Okay, so I see one of them. And the last thing that I want to show you is the actuator. Right? So when we uh, 
hit slash actuator in Spring Boot, you'll see a bunch of endpoints that are exposed automatically for you. So you'll see endpoints that will tell you the different bins that you have in the application context. So if you want to see everything which is in the application context, they are all listed in here. You're going to see endpoints that will tell you the health of the application, for instance, whether it's up or not. And you can have more information here. Uh, things like the environment variables that have been passed. So this is basically all the environment variables that you have uh, coming from different property sources. And one of the um, uh, interesting endpoints is this one here, the metrics endpoint. Right? So set in a Spring Boot, we're going to use micrometer right, for the metrics. So when you click on the uh, metrics endpoint, it will tell you different uh, metrics that you have available. And as I said, these metrics will have uh, a multidimensional approach. So let's take a look, for instance, to the G HTTP servlet requests. So I'm going to uh, take a look at this metric. And we see that we got like 16 um, uh, requests. And we have some available tags. So these available tags will give us this multi-dimension uh, that we require to query this metric. So what if I want to get, for instance, I don't know, uh, let me just go back, the 404 request or a 200 request. So I can just use this tag to say, I want to get the metric, which is called HTTP server request, but could you please filter them by this tag? And we can actually filter by multiple, t multiple tags. I can say, I want to get the get request that ended up in a 404. And we can do that by passing in a parameter, which is called tag, and then we pass key value pairs status uh, 404. So now we see that we have three requests that ended up in a 404. Right? So that's basically the exception that we got with this request. All right, so I think that we'll have to leave it here. So that was real quick, right? Uh, real quick demo. But at least um, a takeaway would be that, uh, well, in Spring 5 and Spring Boot uh, 2, a lot of efforts have been going towards the reactive non blocking support. So we have all the reactive non blocking types which come from the project reactor available not only in the core, but also on all the other. Uh, uh, projects in the portfolio like uh, Spring Data, Spring Integration, uh, Spring Cloud uh, um, Stream, and many other projects in the portfolio. So you, ha you can have an end-to-end -end, uh, reactive pipeline, right? So and that's the important thing to end up having this uh, pipeline from end-to-end. -end. So not having any of these operations which are uh, blocking, because otherwise you won't benefit from the reactive support. Do you have any time for questions? Like, if there are any questions. Couple of questions, maybe. Uh, so authentication uh, is blocking, but um, um, I talk about Spring Security integrating right with all the web flux and all the um, all the methods that use these monos and fluxes. Right? Of course, right, you want to authenticate, and you want to uh, basically authenticate before reaching right, the dispatch server. So this process will be kind of uh, upfront, actually, before right, what's done afterwards. Yes. Right. So. So that's gone, right? So that's uh, basically what we had. But as we are reusing those threads, right, in uh, the different requests, so the one thread per request doesn't apply anymore in, uh, in Webflux. Uh, Spring Security is using the uh, project vector context, which is basically the alternative to uh, the uh, thread local, right? And that, that's where um, you can get the, the security context from, right? sort of from the context of the project reactor. Any other question here? No? All right, so I think we'll leave it here. Thank you. Thank you.